How many of you watched that as a child? Or how many of you watched it with a child? And how many of you feel like both of the above? Right. Oh, Mr. Rogers in the neighborhood. As we continue our series, Love Where You Live, we're talking about loving our neighbors. And so to do that and to really get what, how God would have us to love our neighbors and what that even means, if you would grab your Bible, we're going to head to Luke chapter 10 this morning. Luke chapter 10, we're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture. In Luke chapter 10, I want you to follow along and uh, grab your teaching notes and maybe you're one of those that never follows along, never fills in the blank on your teaching notes, that's okay. If that doesn't serve you, doesn't help you, I'm okay with that. But I do want you to go ahead and grab your teaching notes today because we've got some things to fill in the blank on the front, but there's also something that I really want us all to participate in that's on the back of the notes. And so we'll get to that in just a little bit. But Luke chapter 10, and if you're grabbing a Bible from there in front of you, it's page 735. We'd love for you to be able to follow along. In God's Word, whether it's uh, in the written form, in a, in a bound book, whether it's one that's there in front of you, or you brought your own, or whether it's a uh, device, and you have, that, have an app on a phone or tablet, love for you to be able to follow along. I will have it on the screen, but I just think there's something special about really being able to follow along and see it right there in front of you. Uh, so definitely encourage you to do so. And once in a while, you'll see, and I'll, I'll draw attention to, there's a, a few differences in the way that it will show up on the screen and in the way that some of you will have it written you know, if you had a, a especially different translation than the newer, newer international version. I kind of just wonder, how long does it, is it the new international version? And, and like, keep coming out with new new international word. I don't know. I guess anyway. <laughs> Verse 25. How about we jump into scripture? So I'm going to you. Amen. I'm going to jump in anyway. So here we go. <laughs> On one occasion, an expert in the law. So just to understand who this is that Jesus is going to be having the conversation with. An expert in the law. So this is somebody that not... <laughs> They don't know the speed limit in all 50 states or something like that, or, and all of the different obscure laws. Like, did you know that it's illegal to swear in front of women and children in the state of Michigan? What? Some of you go, oh no. <laughs> yes, it's a law. Okay. But he's not an expert in those laws. He's an expert in the Torah, the first five books of what we have as the Old Testament, the Word of God, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he is an expert. He knows those five books of the law. He knows them frontward and backward. He knows them like the back of his hand. And he comes to Jesus. Why? Because he wants to gain knowledge? No. He wants to test you. And so there's something interesting when somebody comes and Jesus knows the motive of the heart. And so when somebody is truly seeking an answer and they, they really want to grow, they really want truth, Jesus usually doesn't beat around the bush. He'll speak pretty clearly to them. But when somebody is coming and they're just trying to, trying to trick Jesus, trying to trip Jesus up, trying to test Jesus, Jesus often responds like he does here. So he stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here's Jesus' response. It's a question. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? So the teacher of the law answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And, and so he just quoted the, the great commandment, right? What, what we see, and we actually looked at this a few weeks ago, and 
The first thing when we understand that God loves us is to return that love, to reciprocate that love back to Him, and to love Him with all that we have. And so this expert in the law, he starts their great answer, and then he adds on to that, and love your neighbor as yourself. When God's Word tells us that this is an expert in the law, absolutely. I mean, this guy had the right answer. This was the perfect answer. This, after all, is what Jesus himself said. When, when Jesus was asked in another place in Scripture, what, what's the greatest commandment? If you can like, boil it all down, if you could boil the, the, all the laws down into one, or if you could just say, what's the most important? If you pay attention to this, this is, this is going to get you through life. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Is love the Lord your God with all that you have, and love your neighbor as yourself. So this guy's got the right answer, a combination, by the way, of a passage in Leviticus and a passage in Deuteronomy, and he molds them together. And we don't know if, if this happens, if this response comes before Jesus says in another answer to a question of the greatest commandment. We don't know which one comes first, or at least I don't know. I wasn't able to find that. But he's got, he's got the perfect answer, but that's not quite enough. But here's the big idea for today. He, he still is going to press on, and we'll take a look at that. But in his answer, he gives us the big idea. Now, Jesus is going to help us to understand the big idea in a lot more practical and unreal way. But essentially, the response is, be neighborly to your neighbors. Be neighborly to your neighbors. We like to do that, right? We want to be neighborly to our neighbors. And we want to be seen as a good neighbor. At least I, I hope you want to be seen and known as a good neighbor. And so did this guy. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. Again, remember, he stood up to test Jesus. He, he wants to look important. He wants to be recognized as somebody that's got it together. He wants to know that He's, he's at the top of the class. He wanted to be a good neighbor. And I think we all want to be good neighbors. I know I, I want to be a good neighbor. But as Mr. Rogers said in an interview years ago uh, with David Letterman, he said, sometimes things don't always go right in the neighborhood. How many of you know sometimes things don't always go right in the neighborhood? <laughs> I mean, even when you're trying, like back in the day when we lived in the youth parsonage and we had some, some wonderful neighbors, uh, they were close to our age and we're trying to get to know them a little better, Dave and Holly, and some of you may even uh, remember Dave and Holly Randall, and they lived next door to us for a while, and trying to get to know them a little better, and I, I got to know them a lot better after I hit a golf ball into Dave's Mustang window and it shattered his, his window, I got to know Dave a little bit better for that. Not, not the kind of way that you want to, you know, be neighborly. That's that, I'm, I'm not recommending that. But, but they, they handled that great and, and kept having conversation and talking with us and stuff. And we're trying to be good neighbors to them and, and try to invite them to church and be a good influence and, and just uh, help them out in any ways that we can. And we're standing in the backyard talking with them one time. And uh, some of you maybe remember it's been a while, but we used to have a dog named Spike. And uh, if, you, if you remember Spike at all, and for those of you that don't, that's okay. He's a miniature pincher. You know what a, a Doberman pincher is? Okay, this, this was a miniature, and some of, most of you are familiar with the breed. So they look like a Doberman, but they're about that tall. But they've got the attitude of a Doberman. They think they're a Doberman. They don't really, you know, they, they, they're marked like a Doberman, but they're not, not big and tall and strong and all that like a, a Doberman, but he thought he was, and so he had, he had a bad attitude. And he would just bark at everybody, but he wasn't barking at Dave. He was like, okay, thanks, Spike. You're, you're behaving yourself today. And while we're talking and just kind of, you know, Hey, what's going on? And I don't know. I don't remember what we were talking about. But 
happened to see Spike kind of out of the corner of my eye walk up to Dave, and he's not barking, but all of a sudden he lifts his leg. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, my dog weed on my neighbor's nice dress shoes. Leather doctor dress shoes. Sometimes things don't go right in the neighborhood. <laughs> There was another neighbor that moved in shortly after then that had a dog and the dog would get out in the front yard and I had an old pickup that I would drive down to the church once in a while and this dog liked to like run right alongside of the pickup while I was driving down like it annoying me and everything and kind of almost like run in front and, and just bark and everything and so I'd stop and we go through this little thing well this one time the the dogs run along, I stop, got to the side, I got to the side, <laughs> so I gunned it. And I ran over my neighbor's dog. So I had to go and talk to the neighbor and say, I'm sorry, I just ran over your dog, and it's not gonna make it. And then Becky was trying to console them and talk to the, the wife and said, you know. My, my husband, he feels really bad. He, he, he'd be happy to, to marry the dog so that you know, like the kids don't have to be a part of that and everything. Somewhere along the line, she misunderstood something, or I don't know what it was, but knowing that I was a pastor and this offer to bury the dog, they decided, I guess they thought that I was going to perform a funeral service. <laughs> <laughs> For this dog, you know, like, We'll wait till the husband comes home and we got flowers and I don't think the kid wrote a poem or something like that. I don't, you know, I, I don't do dog funerals. I'm sorry. I certainly don't do cat funerals. There's no, there's no, there's no way I'm gonna say a cat's gone to heaven. And contrary to the movie, dogs don't go to heaven either. I'm sorry. But like here, so I did the whole. Moment of silence, and I'm going, I don't think they want to be my neighbors anymore. <laughs> and then it doesn't always go right in the neighborhood. And this guy said, like, he wanted to justify himself, like, tell me I'm a good neighbor. We, we all want to hear I'm a good neighbor. I've passed the test. You can live in my neighborhood. I want to be your neighbor. And so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Like, I just want to make sure, love your neighbors yourself. Like, like, how far down the block are we talking about, Jesus? I mean, there's some people right here I like, they're more like me. But you start getting to the edge of my neighborhood, it gets a little sketchy. You know, I have to love them, too. So if you flip your paper over, you see something that looks a little bit like this. Who is my neighbor? You may not be able to tell it on yours, but on this tic-tac-toe neighborhood, and how many of your neighborhoods look like a tic-tac-toe board? Probably none of you. <laughs> but this, this comes from a book, The Art of Neighboring, and uh, you see it referenced on your paper. You can go ahead and kind of like in tic-tac-toe once in a while, or bingo, or whatever, you be in a free space. We're going to let you go first, okay? And so, on the middle block there, you just go ahead and put your name, your family's name, whatever, and you can just kind of list out your household in that middle box. And then the challenge, and you can do this as I talk, I'm not going to stop and, and let you fill that out. I, I'll pause for just a little bit, but here's what I want you to do. You can start now and just kind of as we go through the morning or maybe later on this afternoon, Try to fill in the rest of the eight boxes with the eight neighbors closest to you. Eight houses, eight apartments, what, whatever it is. The eight home units closest to you. You try to fill in the rest of those boxes. With first names and last names. The best that you can. And, you, and then... How many of you think you can do pretty good with that? With filling in eight? How many of you think you can do like half? 
Yeah. Some of you know, I'm not, not so sure about it. Some of you are like, eh, I think I can get it. I understand this. And I, I haven't like actually sat down and tried to do it, but mentally kind of went through it and talked through it. And I think I can, I think I can get pretty close to this. Um, could fill it up. It's helped that I've lived in the, the same spot for 11 years, and most of my neighbors in, in this area here have lived where they're at for that, that long or longer, so that definitely helps. I also realize that many of us, there's some obstacles in this, right? It, it gets hard to know our neighbors' names because maybe we've got new neighbors or maybe we are the new neighbor. I understand that that can be a challenge. I also understand that it can be really difficult because we don't always have a, a lot of time. We're really busy. And so just kind of trying to figure things out and getting to know them and things like that. I, I understand that. I also know that uh, more and more we have a culture that doesn't spend a lot of time outside. Even though we've had some really beautiful weather, that we live in a culture that people just aren't outside as much as they used to be. True? I mean, we, we go to work and we drive home, not everybody, but, but some of us, we, we don't even have to get out of our car. We, we just hit a little button, the door comes up, we pull in, hit another button, the door comes down, and there we are. Until it's time to get up and go to work again in the morning. You know, we push the button, and up goes the door, and out we go. Down goes the door, and, and that's it. So I understand there are some challenges. I also understand that some of us, we don't have those naturally those natural ends to, to communicating and building a relationship with those that are in our neighborhood. Like, like it helps if, you, if they have children, you have children, especially if their children are close to the same age as your children. And you can talk about children. You can talk about parenting and the challenges of parenting. And who, does your who does your child have for a teacher? Or, or what's this? You know, what's going on? And how are they doing? And, things like that, or if you got a pet and they got a pet and you're out walking your dog and they have a dog, it, it, makes, it just kind of makes conversation a little easier. And, and I recognize that we don't always, don't always have that, those common denominators. I also recognize that many of you, some of you anyway, don't live actually that close. You're not that close to your neighbors because you're not that close to your neighbors. They're Half a mile down the road, most of them, you know, you can go quite a ways before you have another house. I get all of them. I still think it's a good exercise to just kind of start with where we live, if we're going to love where we live, to start where we live and see how well we can love those that live near us, those that are in proximity. So let's go back, shall we? Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. He was stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest, Jesus goes on to say, happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, there's two different words that are going to come up three times. The first one is this word, saw. I want you to see there's going to be three people, and you probably know the story, but there's something I want to really pull out today. Three different people. The priest will see the Levite in a little bit, and most of you know, you know the story, the Samaritan, and we know him as the good Samaritan. But all three of them are walking by. All three of them will see, saw the man. I'll tell you the other word we're going to pay attention to in just a little bit. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan. And we know the story of, even if you haven't grown up in the church, you've probably heard the story about the Good Samaritan. What you may not know, if you haven't grown up in the church, haven't spent too much time in the church, is who the Samaritans are. Or who they would have represented. Or how the, the people would have responded, and even the teacher in the law would have responded when Jesus said a Samaritan. Okay? These are the 
the enemies of the Jews. These are half-breeds. These are people that the Jews looked at as if they weren't people. Like, I'd rather be a dog than a Samaritan. I mean, they hated Samaritans. And so at first, when Jesus says a Samaritan, it's, it's like the rest of those that are around would be like, boo, yes. And, and, you know, I mean, even to a greater extent than, than like when we talk up here, if you're a Michigan fan, and, and somebody mentions a bucket, like, boo, yes. Right? I mean, like, just don't like it, or, or Wolverines and Sparty, and just kind of this animosity. I mean, not even close. Not even close to the animosity that would have been there between the Jews and the Samaritan. But Jesus, like Jesus often does, Jesus flips the script and like, you guys think Samaritans, that you're so much better than the Samaritans, and that they're not even like counted as people. But watch this. The Samaritans, the good guy. The Samaritans, the one that gets it right. The priest. The Levite? Levite would have been somebody that, like, <coughs> kind of like a board member. They weren't the priest, but they were, they were leaders in the church. They had responsibilities. They didn't do the right thing, but here the Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. As I was reading through this passage, not only did the word saw just kind of jump out to me because I saw the word saw three different times, and when I, I see a certain word more than once in a, in a relatively short passage of Scripture, that gets my attention. All three of them saw the man, but then we had this other word, took. Everybody say took. <laughs> Took's kind of a weird word, isn't it? Took. And they just got took. But took pity on him. Oh, uh, hmm. Got my mind thinking. So I looked up, took pity on him. And, and what's, what's the Greek? And how does this translate it in other places? And just trying to figure that out and, and take a look at that. And, and the word that we have there, and I'm not going to tell you what it, what it is in the Greek because... I can't really pronounce it anyway. Not that you would know any different, but what, what, what's important to understand is not so much what the word is or how to say the word. It's what the word means. It's this indication, this implication that there's this kind of a turning of the innards. Like, it, it affects you. Do you know what I mean? Like, compassion, that's, that's the word that's often translated as is translated compassion. In fact, if you're following along, it it may say he had compassion on him or for him. It just turned like you hear a story or you see something happen, and you just wow, that's not right. That needs to be fixed. That needs to be helped. They they need they need me to do something. I want to do something. It was interesting to me. I. Just did a little cross-referencing. The, the word that we have translated took and then took pity on him, the, the word compassion, as it's often translated in Scripture, is, often, is also found in a few other places. It's also found in the story, the parable of the, the prodigal son. When the father sees the son from a distance, he had compassion on him. He took pity like, that boy is messed up. He needs help. And I love him. He, like, it turned up. The word's also used when Jesus has an interaction with a widow whose son had just died. So not only had she lost her husband, but now her, her only child lays dead in her arms. And Jesus sees this picture. And probably like you, if you looked on and saw a mother that didn't even have her husband anymore, and now she's holding her dead boy in her arms, and scripture says, and he took pity or he had compassion on her. And it says, and so he went to her and he healed her son. He brought her son back to life. It's also used in a couple other places in scripture where Jesus 
comes on the scene and there's this large crowd gathered and says he looked on them with compassion. Or you can tell that they were helpless and harassed, like sheep without a shepherd. You see, when Jesus saw a crowd, he didn't just see a, a crowd. He saw the people, he saw the faces, he saw the need, and it did something in him. Which takes us to the first thing that I want us to understand about being neighborly. Being neighborly begins with seeing your neighbor as a person. Seeing your neighbor as a person. As the priest walked by and the Levite walked by, they both saw the man, but they didn't see him as a person. They didn't, they didn't go, hey, there's a guy that needs help. There's a guy that's like you and me and he's bleeding. There's, there's a guy that, that probably has a family that, that, would, that, that really care about him a lot. There, there's a guy that possibly has a child at home. There's a guy that, no, they, what did they see him? They saw him as a problem. They saw him as an inconvenience. What about you? How do you see your neighbors? Do you see them as people? Or do you see them as the irritants who have a lot of cats? Or do you see them as the ones that just they have, you know, the ones with the barking dogs? You know, the one with the loud truck that they go to work before we get up and they start the truck and not just start the truck, but they give it a couple extra clumps, you know. You, you know, those stinking Republicans that, you know, those, those dumb Democrats that live you, you know, and we, we get these labels and we can set them aside and we label them and in a way identify them not by their humanity, but in a way that somehow puts them different than us, somehow less than. And I think if we see something in this parable of the Good Samaritan, I think Jesus wants us to understand that being neighborly begins with seeing your neighbor as a person. It's interesting to me to know that Jesus identifies the priest of the Levite automatically. You know in the story that they're Jews. Jesus identifies the Samaritan. So automatically you know he's a Samaritan. Jesus is making a point to the, the, the teacher, the expert of the law. But Jesus doesn't identify the man that had been wrong. Jesus didn't say he was a Jew. Most scholars would assume and, and think that he probably was. And Jesus didn't say he was a Samaritan. Or maybe none of the above. Jesus says...
This is probably the big rub when it comes to being neighborly. We, we can see them as people. We, we can be okay with that. But I think one of the hardest things for us in our society is our schedules, our lack of time. <coughs> How many of you would say, I've got a busy schedule. I don't have time for a lot of extra stuff. I know people are busy. I also know when sociologists and psychologists would tell us that as we've progressed and we've become more uh, influxed with social media and more involved with social media, the more that we seem to be connected through the internet and things like Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that, do you know what's actually happening? You would think that that relationally we're better, but we're worse. There's a higher rate of loneliness, so I'm told, different polls and, and researchers and things like that, higher levels of loneliness now than maybe ever before in the United States. We're more connected. We, I, we've got a cell phone. Most people have a cell phone. Call them anytime. But we don't have the time to call them any time because we're, we're so busy. I, I want you to know I very intentionally chose the word take. A couple of reasons. One, it's a, it's a form of took. He took care of him. It's a word of take. But some would maybe be tempted to use the word willingness to make time for others. Now here's the rub with that. How many of you can make time? Anybody figure that one out? If you could, if you know how, I'd love to talk to you. Because if we could stretch 24 hours into 26, that would be pretty helpful. Harvest time for our farmers, that, that'd be kind of helpful for some of you probably. You know, there, there's different times like, if I could just have more hours in the day. Guess what? Probably wouldn't change a whole lot. You'd, you'd still end up being... And we probably still find ourselves going, I don't have time to be neighborly. I think scripture shows, and I think Jesus set the example of this. And Jesus was busy. Jesus was crazy busy. But yet Jesus still was able to seemingly take time for people in need. The Levite, the priest, no doubt, they were busy. They had important things to do. I mean, the priest, I can kind of relate to that. Put myself in his <coughs> relatively easily. Yeah, I, I know they're saying, I gotta do this, I gotta. And it can be tempting to just, you know, that's just another problem. It's just something else that's going to sidetrack me. But so wait a minute, that's the first thing. Take time. Take time. So look, can, just throw out a couple of suggestions, a couple of ideas as we look to attend to somebody, to give them attention. We, we say, well, there are things I have to do. So you start looking at your schedule, like, there are things that I have to do. And I, I get that. There are things that I have to do. There are things that you have to do. Rallies would tell me, I have to eat. I have to eat. How many of you, you have to eat? Here's, here's, a, here's a thought. A thought. What if you could invite somebody in, invite a neighbor in to join you? You have to eat. Guess what? They have to eat. What if you would invite them for a meal to come? Something you're going to be spending time doing anyway, fixing a meal and eating a meal. Hey, come on over and you can eat, join us and have a little conversation. Maybe it takes a little bit more time than you normally would when you eat. But you're, you're letting them in on something and it's something that you would be doing anyway. Or you have to go to the grocery store. Hey, would you like to join me? I, I know you don't. Maybe you don't say it this way, but they have trouble getting out, especially on their own. Would you like to join me? I'm headed to the grocery store. Would you like to ride along? 
There are other ways, there are different things that we can do. Things that we have to do, they have to do. Maybe we can do them together. Another thing that I'll just throw out, and maybe you'll take it and say, yeah, thank you, and I'm going to throw that out. But the things that you have to do, do you really have to do them? Because there are things on our list that we can say, I, I, I have to do this. But if something else came up, like if, if I was able to say, I got some free tickets to the Lions game, all of a sudden what you had to do, you don't have to do anymore. True story? Okay, maybe it's not the Lions game. Like, no, I, I have to go to the dentist and get all my teeth pulled. I'd rather do that than go to the Lions. But there are some things that we would say we have to do that we don't really have to. I think being neighborly requires a willingness to take time for others. Let's go back to the text. Verse 35, the next day the Samaritan what did he do? He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now I went back and I looked up, I looked up the word this in the, the Greek again to see, well, what's this one? And this one didn't really help me out a lot. It's to, he, to, he just grabbed it, like taking it out of his wallet. He just, he's bringing it forth. But there's something in this, nonetheless. Being neighborly means loving without expecting it to be a two way street. You see, the Good Samaritan, he did, like, you know what? If I help this Jew sometime down the road, it's going to come back. You know, that whole thing, what well, goes around, comes around. I scratch your back, you scratch my back. I let you borrow my mower, you're going to let me borrow your weed eater. I let you borrow this, you're going to let me do that. I, I say hi to you and, and act like I like you, you're going to let me borrow your, your new hot rod and take it for a spin. No, there's, there's no expectation on the Samaritan's part. He's like, you know, innkeeper, here's, I'm, I'm going to take care of him, and here's some money, and if it costs more than that. I'm not going to say, hey, he's on his own now or whatever. I, I'm going to, I'll be good for that too. There's no expectation on his part. But it seems like the American way is kind of like this, it's really manipulation. It's not love. It's, I'm going to help you because I'm trusting that someday that's going to pay off for me. Down the road. I don't think that's love. The Samaritan demonstrated love. When, when the expert in the law is like, this is, this is what it is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus is like, okay, now let's talk about what that is. That means loving without expecting it to be a two-way street. I'm going to be neighborly to you even if you're not neighborly to me. I don't know if you know the name Keisha Thomas or not. It probably doesn't ring a bell for probably any of you. It's certainly not one that I, you said if somebody would say Keisha Thomas and everybody goes, oh yeah, I know that story. Like if I say the good spirit and everybody goes, yeah, I know that one. I don't know Keisha Thomas' name, but in 1996, her photo was taken. And it ended up being one of the photos of the year. You see, in 1996, there was a KKK march in Ann Arbor. And it was announced ahead of time that they were going to be marching, and so there were others that decided they were going to do a, a counter protest. They were going to protest against the KKK, and so they gathered together and they had their picket signs and, and they were ready to, to say what was wrong with the KKK and everything, and they had their group, and then there was the group of those that were part of the KKK. And when did you know it, somebody had slipped into those that were protesting against the KKK that had a Confederate flag shirt on, and somebody noticed that they had a tattoo that would have been part of the KKK. 
And so they yell out, Hey! And they, you know, like, get him! And so this throng of protesters started chasing after this gentleman. They use the word gentleman loosely. Chased after him, knocked him down, and started beating on him and kicking him. Until Keisha showed up and jumped in and laid over his body to keep the others from doing anything more. And he only basically stopped it, beat him alone. Something that certainly wasn't being really different. Somebody that easily would have called her a bunch of names. Somebody that potentially would have looked to have caused her harm. And then she said, he's a person. I don't like what he stands for. But he's a person. And basically what she was in later, she, she pretty much just said, I just, I just did the right thing. It's the right thing. Nobody should be treated. Being angrily is about doing the right thing. It, it goes back to something that you've probably heard before, kind of asking that question, what would Jesus do? It, it, in our context, in our text today, maybe it's what would the Good Samaritan do? Or, or what would Keisha do? But ultimately, it goes back to Christ's love, God's love. How does God love us? Because that's what Jesus said. Love one another as I have loved you. And as we follow the story, and we come back to the text, Jesus has another question that he asks the expert in the law. He says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Which one was neighborly to his neighbor? I mean, we know, we know the answer to the question. We know it's obvious. And, and there's something in this that points out to that being neighborly isn't confined to those that are in our neighborhood. Being neighborly isn't confined to just those that are a part of our tic-tac-toe neighborhood. Like being neighborly is about just being human. Being neighborly is about loving anybody that comes in our path with the love of Jesus. And the expert in the law, he he was pretty sharp. He figured it out. He replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. What would Jesus do? Not just what would Jesus think. What does Jesus know? The expert of the law knew. <coughs> what were you going to follow in your heart? So my love your neighbor as yourself. There's something about this to do that he needed a little help with. And while neighboring or being neighborly isn't confined to your neighborhood, it's a great place to start. It's a great place to start. And I think, I think you have a neighbor, maybe four of them. And there's no question in my mind, but I do too. But though they wouldn't necessarily say it, and they're not going to sing the song, they're pleading in their heart, won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please. Please. Won't you be my neighbor? There are a lot of lonely, hurting, desperate people out there. Not, not necessarily that they've been beat up, they're robbed, left half naked. 
you know, but through one form or another, one way or another, they've been isolated, they've been kind of cast off. Maybe it's even on their own shoes. I mean, sometimes you can't force them. You can't force them to like you. You can't force them to hang out with you or spend time with you, but you can, you can try. You can love them where they're at. So leave it up to them and then to see how they respond. Won't you be there? I'm going to invite our pastors to make their way forward as well as the praise team. So we continue to worship the Lord for singing. And as well for giving, we have an opportunity to be neighbors, to be neighborly to, to some of our own. Oftentimes being neighborly is doesn't it doesn't involve those that are already part of the church, those that are family. But we also we also believe it's really important to love our own. You guys have done a great job with that. Yeah, we wanted to show in a, in a very practical way demonstration of love for one of our own families that is going through a time of need. So again, if you'd like to give to the newest part of the love offering, just make sure that you mark it on the envelope, clearly the love offering. And if you're writing a check, write it out. It's directly to the end. That will help us out. Father,